everyone. Welcome once again to one of our Hobby Memorial Library events. We have our partnership with Mayborn Science Theater, and we have our CTC astronomer, Warren Hart, with us Hello, today. hello. Hi. Well, Good you've to got, see all of you. Yeah, you've got a packed, a packed uh, agenda today. Uh, so, we will rumble through it. <laughs> so tell me when. Okay, let's go ahead and get it started. If you want to tell people uh, where to find us uh, when we're not on and where you get all the resources that we're going to show them today, uh, okay. the constellations and things. All right, well, this is where you go. You hit research study guides on the library website. You find Astronomy and Mayborn Science Theater. And then it takes you to all this amazing information that we work with today. And look what we got here, Warren. Oh, what's there it that? is. Yep, what's that? It says, I uh, can read it. It's something like 173 days to go until the total solar eclipse of next year. Yep, yep, exciting. Outstanding, less than 200 days. Yep. Yeah, and this is where all the maps, the calendars, and all the additional information that we're going to be talking, Warren's going to be talking about today, we get on this website, plus additional books, databases, all that fun stuff, So and like internet resources. Mm -hmm. so, so, are we ready? Uh, we're ready. Let's start out, since today is the middle of October, in essence, pretty close. We're going to look here at the second page of October, and you see there on the top row on the 18th there in red and blue is what we're doing today. And so wanted to let you know where we wanted to start out. And as we go, let's get it uh, and go to our first uh, point of information, if you'll see above the red uh, uh, information, there's something about, it says, what is that word? Zodiacal light. Oh, okay. And if you notice, it is, goes, and I have it it's there for Monday through uh, all the week, and into next week, and we actually have a, a, a drawing or a picture of what zodiacal light looks like. If you look, you will see the dark for the horizon. And uh, that is not taken from outside the planetarium here looking anyway. So, uh, and then just above is kind of a pinkish uh, uh light in the sky and then above a little bit there it looks like there's a lighter almost uh, 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 white not a pure white but if you were to draw a picture in in the, trying to describe what does that look like and Cindy can scroll up or scroll down for and it's going to look like a triangle. And this is because it's this time of the year in the fall that our ecliptic path of the sun, the moon, the planets, uh, as we are going around the sun in our orbit here on Earth, it will tilt so it is virtually almost straight up and down. So we are looking at it from that viewpoint and what we have in our ecliptic path as we go around the sun, we have kind of the dust, if you will, from the uh, comets that have gone by earlier. And as they go and travel through space, they are constantly dropping off some of their uh, the material that they have there may be coming from the 
uh, the head of the comet, maybe from the tail or both. And because it's uh, the angle here is straight up and down, we are getting a good reflection of those particles that uh, the light from the sun re reflects off of it, and it gives us this picture that we see here. And so this is in the fall, and it's called the zodiacal light, named for the zodiac, of the the name for the ecliptic. So that's an, an interesting thing. And if we can go back to the calendar, Cindy, they can see, the people can see, it's all this week. So this uh, tomorrow morning, if you haven't seen it, you can go out in the morning and take a look to the east and you should find it. And you notice that it is expected to continue into next week and finish uh, around Thursday of next week. So you got time to find it. And if you have friends, family, or whoever, and you want to talk about it, you can also guide them how to find it in the sky. I found it. It's in this, the fall. I found it this morning. Oh, you I did? I got here early, and I saw it over our um, our CTC campus. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. It, so this happens in uh, the fall like this, and the other time it's going to be next year, it will be in the springtime. So anyway, that's something that you can point out uh, to our the people. Well, we're going to continue on. So let's go, if you will, <clears throat> and you notice on the Saturday of the calendar, there it talks about uh, the moon is at its first quarter. It's past the new moon. And uh, we're, it's going on around orbiting the Earth. So we'll just uh, talk about the, how it's going as we go through today. Now, let's we look down on the second week there. And on Tuesday, the 24th, we have the notice it says the sixth. Hmm the sixth of the seven constellations for the month of October. And I just wanted to remind you that you still have the opportunity to find them. And so on the sixth, we have the sea monster or the whale, and that is Cetus. And Cindy, if you want to give them the picture of what we have, there it is. And, uh, we, you can see that in the sky and the Tropic of Capricorn. So you're going to be looking to the south. Uh, and you notice that predominantly most of it is in the southern hemisphere. There's the equator. So Cetus, the area in the sky that's designated for Cetus, straddles the equator. There's part of it in the northern hemisphere and then another part of it that's in the southern hemisphere. So I usually call this, I would say, the equatorial constellation Cetus, to give people an idea of where to look for it. All right, thank you, Cindy. Let's go on and let's see what's next in our calendar. And we go and we see the Wednesday of next week, the moon is going to be at something called the perigee. And some of you have been listening, I'm sure, to what I've been saying through the year, what a perigee is. And it also tells in there, as I describe it, notice it says, as we read on down, it's the ninth closest to the Earth of the 13 perigean moons for the year of 2023. So we got number nine and we have four more to go in November and December to finish it up. And uh, when we looked last week, last Saturday for the 
uh, solar eclipse uh, brought on by the moon in front of the sun for us here at the planetarium we did not get uh, what would be called the annular a-n-n-u-l-a-r uh, solar eclipse or lunar eclipse either way and the reason was we had a partial eclipse because we were not on the path we were uh, actually north of the path and uh, i've heard of some friends that drove down to san antonio so they could see the actual real annular and they were able to see uh, what is called when the moon is at, in the center of the sun and it is uh, there around it is the sum of the sun and they have the what is called the ring of fire. We were in now, Marble Falls and we got to see the ring and almost the entire section. Very yeah. good. Yeah. So uh -huh. cool. Well, at that time last week, if we would uh, look back up earlier in October, we would see that the moon was in its apogee part of the orbit, which means that it was far away, the farthest away on the orbit. And so the only way you would have been able to have the ring of fire would be that the moon would be so far away that it would not be large enough, its shadow, its uh, backside to us, would not be able to cover all of the sun. Now, next year in April, when we have our total solar eclipse, we want it to be at that perigee position. We want it larger, closest to us, than when it travels in front of the sun. So it'll block it all out and then we can see the corona and the planets and the stars that are up in the sky right at that time. But as soon as the moon is gone, we can't see them because the sun. So anyway, let's go on. And on Saturday the 28th, as the moon continues on, it comes around and it's going to be behind us as we would look toward the sun and we would look in our shadow for the full moon and that's what you have now <clears throat> uh, also on sat this uh, next week saturday uh, that's when i'm at the planetarium and i will be talking about next month's constellations there are seven for the month of november and that's what I'll be talking about and also what else is happening for November. Let's scroll down to the last. And actually, Cindy, we could just go right ahead and drop this one off and pick up our November calendar. And when you do that, we will get then the same thing as we go to the top of the, of the uh, November calendar and notice on the left in the gray area is the last part, the last three days of October. And so there's the information that's on there. And so at the end of a month, then you have an overlap of uh, on the calendar of what is going to be the first week of the next month. And that's why you would uh, have it here. And as we go on then, uh, on Tuesday the 31st will be the last of the seven constellations for October. And that is Triangulum. And I wonder what that looks like, Cindy. Let's bring it up, the Triangulum. Well, it looks like a triangle. It's the... A professor or the astronomer that chose to call or name this really had a hard time figuring out what to call it. I mean, all you have to do is choose any three stars in the sky and theoretically connect them up in your mind there, and you got a triangle. Uh, 
hope you didn't d dwell too long on choosing <laughs> this. But notice also an interesting thing, the triangulum the, there, it straddles our latitude, which means that to see triangulum, you would look directly overhead. It's right above us, right above us at the what we call the zenith position. It's 90 degrees up from the horizon. And again, now for it, it's in the northern hemisphere. And you can tell by looking off to both sides. And you see that the indication for the latitude of the uh, object and the partial uh, the part of the sky it's a plus 40 degrees meaning it's north of the equator plus 30 plus 20 as it all as we would see that as we would go on okay thank you cindy let's go back to the calendar before we and... go back to the calendar your your red splotches here is that flying saucers or you want to tell us what they are <laughs> oh well uh no they're not flying saucers they may have some in there uh each one a red indication is that is a galaxy it is a if you need I want to say it is another type of, of the milky way in which we uh live in and so the two of them and the one there that is labeled as the letter A, that is the Triangulum Galaxy. And wonder why we named it that. Well, it's in the Triangulum Constellation area. And then up to the, the upper right of it, and it has the label M31, which stands for Messier, the French astronomer in the 1700s. And 31 means it was the 31st object in the sky, the sky that he wanted to list, and he got the information. And he was in the process of trying to find comets. Now, we have to remember, in the 1700s, that was not even uh, 100 years after Galileo, who started this with a very basic telescope and so Messier had a telescope that was nowhere near uh, the capability of what we have and can use today. So all he would be looking for would be, and we can use a technical term, a smudge of something in the sky. And that is a whole collection what it is of stars and, and things there in that other galaxy. So M31, and by the way, we mentioned it last month, that M31, the Andromeda galaxy, is the farthest object you can see when you go outside and find it in the sky, and you do not need binoculars or a telescope, and it will be faint, and as you concentrate on it, you will recognize uh, it. And to, to be able to see it, it must be completely dark, no moon, no sky glow from any neighboring cities or anything, no uh, outdoor lights, no car lights or anything. You want it completely dark so you can see it. And it is just a little over 2 million light years away. Okay. So that's enough on our triangulum. And thank you, Cindy, about mentioning what those are. And uh, we can go on. So let's get into November. Oh, by the way, look at October the 31st down at the bottom, the very last thing. At the end of October, you will have gone through, for those who've been going with us each month, that uh, we you would have gone through 71 of the 88 constellations for the year, which is 81%. And then you look in on Wednesday, the November the 1st, 
and there in the middle, it says we have 17 constellations yet to be toured, and we have 19% at the beginning of November that we need, uh, we have to keep going. And then on uh, Thursday the 2nd, there's an, uh, another place where uh, Cindy talked about at the very beginning of how to find the Astronomy Lib Guide, and in the blue is the link that you can go right to it. Any comments on that, Lynn, uh, Cindy? No, just, um, you know, guys, check it out. It's got a lot of amazing information that uh, Warren continuously puts, including fun space activities. We haven't talked that uh, talked about that in a while, but he's got all kind of really co cool, fun space games too, on that. Okay, good. On Friday we have the what is called the equation of time. Now, uh, Cindy, you should have a uh, picture of that. There you go. If you look at the standard. A uh, schoolroom glo uh, globe of uh, Earth, you'll see out in the Pacific Ocean an odd shaped number eight. Well, here it is here. And what that is giving to us is if you look in the middle of the diagram over to the far right in that uh, purple color, the celestial equator that it, that gives us an idea and then you see vertically there in the middle of the lower part of the eight uh, something called meridian okay the two things that path is the path of the sun as we go around the sun for the year and so it will show us to the left and right uh, how far away is it, and also in time from when we would expect to see it uh, from the regular time for our uh, longitude here. And then the up and down is how far north or south of the equator is the sun. So that gives us both uh, pieces of information in that diagram. And as you look, if you see there at the top of the uh, small part of the number eight and look at the crossover at the uh, where the two come together, and then there is September the one first, follow in the counter clock in the clockwise direction, excuse me. We go down and there was the fall equinox on the 20th, 21st, and you keep going. There is the October the first. And so you're getting an idea of where we would be as far as in relation to the sun and it's going to continue on around and you notice that we have in november the first it's going to be about the looking at the top up there the fastest uh, uh in front of the average time for what we would call noon so it would be Faster, it's going to be earlier in the morning that it's there. And it goes all the way down. And there in the green, there is our winter solstice. That's December. Solstice is Latin. S-O-L is sun. And the S-T-I-C-E means that it has stopped. Solstice, the sun has stopped. So... It seems to, as we would watch in the sky, keeping track of it as it was going down toward the south. And if you plotted it and followed, it was going further south. And then finally, about December the 20th, 21st, that it seemed to slow down and it 
stopped. It quit going south. So that is the solstice. And as it continues, you see January 1st, it's beginning to come back up toward the equator. Thank you, Cindy. See, and, and more information for that is on the LibGuide page talking about the solstice the equation, equation of time. Now, as we continue on there on Saturday, we have the first of the seven November constellations, and that is Hydrus. And Hydrus, Cindy will put that up for us. And we have, oh, let's see the name of it, run it back up there for us. Yeah, we have, for whatever reason, we have two snakes in the sky. And this one, Hydrus, is the male water snake. And so there it is in the sky. And if you notice, are we going to see it? Well, what's that in purple there just below the beginning of the uh, diagram? And what does it say? It says that is our planetarium southern horizon. So that uh, dash and dotted line of our southern horizon is as far south you can see. It's on the south southern horizon. So what does that mean? You're not going to see any of those stars in Hydrus unless you decide to travel south and bring that part, the southern part, uh, uh, up for you able to see it in the sky. And you have to go quite a ways to get, get that up there. Or you can go so, to the planetarium. I, or you can come to the planetarium because what we will do uh, on uh, following Saturday, that's when I will be pointing out how to find and to see if you were able to go, but uh, where Hydrus is and how it looks in the sky. Thank you, Cindy. Al, while we also have it there, you notice uh, there, there are two more galaxies. And there is to the uh, right, there is a SMC. And to the left, there is an LMC. Well, let's take the one on the left first. That stands for the larger or the largest MC Messianic or Mag Magellanic, excuse me, the wrong M, <laughs> the largest Magellanic uh, galaxy that we have. And uh, so there it is. And the one on the right is the smallest. What happened? This was when Magellan went on in his ship uh, all the way around the world, kept track of it, and mentioned about these in the sky. And so there we have the LMC and the SMC. Okay. Now let's go back to the page and let's see what we have as far as uh, on Saturday the 4th. Is there anything else on Saturday the 4th? Oh, it's in red. Well, a little notice before going to bed that night, for those of you that want to set your clock then, or if you want to prefer and wait till Sunday morning the 5th at 2 o'clock in the morning, Wait and set your time for all your clocks and watches and whatever you have. Uh, that's up to you. But that is when we will change from the central uh, d uh, daylight sta uh, standard time. And we go to the central standard time. And now well, let's scroll down to the second week there, Cindy. And we see that we also have uh, in the early morning, uh, there is the moon at its third quarter. And then on Monday the 6th, the moon in its orbit is at its apogee. 
and you can read that and you can get the what the word means it is the farthest away from earth in that orbit so it's the 10th farthest of the 13 uh, apogeal moons then on uh, wednesday the 8th it's five months until the total solar eclipse going on on Thursday the 9th, we have the moon uh, there, and it's close to the planet Venus. And you notice that's in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. And the moon will help you to locate the planet Venus uh, for you. And also that evening on Thursday is the second of our seven constellations for November, and this one is Aries, and it is called also the Ram, and Cindy has that one to bring up, so let's take a look at it. There it is, the Ram, and notice in relation to it, look just above in the gray the word triangulum. That was our first constellation for November. So what I try to do each month is get them as close as possible into as straight up and down a line that you don't have to go back and forth, left and right. So you find triangulum and you go down and there is Aries. And there you can see it. And there is the, our red triangle, uh, triangulum galaxy M33. And next month, you'll see in Taurus, we're going to have something called M45. And we'll talk about that next month. And then there's Aries and uh, all its information. And let's just scroll, Cindy, on down to the third page. Every page has additional information that will explain and give you uh, uh, info on each of the stars that are on the, the page that are circled with numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and then also uh let's see we have no galaxies or uh, anything else there in this one but uh we will have uh later in another constellation and then there's more info below and you can read that each time of what each of the things on the first page uh is indicating for us thank you cindy now let's look back at the calendar and we're going to see as we have uh, moving, uh, as we're moving on, on Friday the 10th is uh, Veterans Day. That's the day it's observed. And on the 11th is the day of the actual day of remembrance. And that's based, if I remember right, on World War I. The 11th day of the 11th month at 11 o'clock in the morning was the end of World War I. I believe I have my history correct on that. Okay, let's go on down to the next one and the next page on it. And on the 12th, we go to our, on Sunday, our third of the seven constellations, and this is Fornax and its name is the Furnace, and Cindy will bring that up. By the way, as you have it there, Cindy, the basic, the initial name, Fornax, is in Latin. All of the constellations, their formal name is in Latin, but then in whatever country you live in, whatever language you speak, then that uh, added on is for like for here for the United States and where we are, we want it in English. So we say it is the furnace and that's what the Latin fornax means. And there it is, not a whole lot. 
uh, that's there. And if you look above Fornax, what do you see that's written in? You see Cetus. Oh, okay, we had that. And, oh, uh, well, we're going uh, down in a pretty well a straight line as we're progressing through the November constellations, and that's the purpose for it. Now, we do have an interesting thing. Uh, if you notice in the very middle of the uh, white area of the area that's designated for each constellation, I have what's called the CVP. That's the central viewing point. So if you were to look at that point in the sky, you would be able, you would be in the middle of the area in the sky for, in this case, for Fornax. But we have something over here on the left, and it has Hudaf and Exodaf. Well, wonder what is H-U-D-F and E-X-D-F. Do you have anything for that, Cindy? Let's see. And then we also have a question, too. Okay. So, yeah. Do you want to answer the question first, or do you want sure, to? Sure. Uh... What's the question? Okay. Alyssa, what was the question? It's not showing up again. Um. Uh, someone was just wondering if there was an astronomy club here at CTC. Oh, well, we thought about it uh, at times, but it's not happened yet. Uh, you have to have a, a professor or staff member or somebody to be the sponsor. And uh, so uh, there's still hope that we might get it. There is the what's called the Temple Amateur uh, Astronomy Club, uh, based out of Temple and somewhat out of Waco also. But uh, there would be enough people here, uh, I think, for for the uh, campus to have its own CTCD uh, Campus Astronomy Club. We can talk to the planetarium staff. We'll yeah, see if, if somebody if over there could. is interested. Yeah, yeah, it's sponsoring. Yeah. Great idea. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now, notice here on the interesting information, the bottom uh, lower part down there in blue, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. There's your HUDF, and there's a whole bunch of information. And then just below you know, there, and also in green, is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, EXDEF, and there's some more information. But we do have a couple of pictures of what they're talking about. So here's the first one. There is the Hubble, if you will, the Extreme Deep Field, and the, uh, called also by some the Time Tunnel into History. And there you can see this was taken, and if we were still reading on the uh, page there, that it's, this is made up of a whole series of numbers of a telescope, the Hubble uh, telescope, staying on the uh, area here in the sky for the, that uh, galaxies and the areas and every <clears throat> everything you see are galaxies. There, uh, what we have, there are so far away. We have not don't have the technology yet for the ones that are very far away to break out uh, separate stars. But you can see the general shape of each of the galaxies. And uh, talking about, now notice, then Cindy, let's scroll to the top of the, this page here for it. There you go. It says, time tunnel into history. And let me point out, every time you look into the sky, what you see, you are looking into history. For instance, 
Now you don't look at the sun, but you know where the sun is during the day, but you don't see where it is. You see where it was when that uh, those uh, that light, those photons left the sun traveling at the speed of light and getting to us in approximately eight and a half minutes. So we see, if you will, where the sun was eight and a half minutes ago. We look at the moon, the moon is closest to us, so it's approximately no more than two seconds away from us. But anytime you look out there and you see anything, it is going to be, uh, if it's planets, it's going to be in time, uh, minutes and hours, many hours. And then once we leave our own solar system, then the time thing would be so long and it would be hard to keep track of. Then we change over to light years because the closest next object to us after our, our own uh, solar system is, is the star uh, that we have that is 4.3 uh, light years away. And that's in the constellation of, uh, I'm trying to pull up in my mind, uh, there that it's um, telling us that the light from those stars, that star took 4.3 million uh, or 4.3 light years to travel to us. I'm getting my millions all messed up here because I'm still looking at the page on the about the ultra deep field uh, in there. So uh, you're always looking into history. All right, Cindy, let's see the other picture about the initial one on the Hubble. That's the extreme field. And you have also the basic field itself, the one that started all this off. And if you'll bring that one up. And, it's up. Okay. And we have it here. And that's the first one that gave us. And the nose, there is information <clears throat> on it. There's a whole bunch of pages, 10 pages to be exact all giving you the background on how they did that. And so um, there you give you, you that that was a big thing for Hubble at that time. And that was our first time to see something of with a significant detail that it was outside of our own uh, galaxy itself, our Milky Way galaxy. Now we have better pictures with the um, with the web. Yeah. What is it called? Uh, the James Webb. Yes. And as technology continues to improve, we will be able to see farther and uh, also in more. <clears throat> pardon me. More and more detail. Very good, Cindy. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Now we go back, if you will to our page and we have <clears throat> in, in here and uh, let's see where we are. 13th. We, pardon? We're on the 13th. We are on the 13th. Th the moon is uh, starting a new orbit around the earth. So it's uh, starting at what we call the new position. That means it's in between us and the sun as we would look toward the sun. And actually, you don't ever see the new moon because we're looking at its backside, its shadow side, its dark side, if you uh, uh, want to check on that. Then on the 15th of November, uh, we're going to have our next Facebook presentation, and <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the December constellations. And notice it's a slam 
bam, whatever of constellations in December. We finish it all up and we have 10 of them to go. And so uh, at the end of December, we will have finished going through all of the 88 constellations. And then in January, we start over again. There is uh, on Friday the 17th, there will be a major meteor shower, uh, Leonid, <clears throat> and that name comes from the constellation Leo the Lion because wherever the meteor shower seems to come from, uh, there in, is what constellation of the area in the sky is it? And this happens to be in Leo, so the name is added Leonid uh, Meteor Shower. And from sunset through the sunrise, it would be a time to go out and see the meteor shower. Let's scroll down to the next week, and we have now the fourth of our seven constellations, Horologium. Horologium. Get my accent correctly here. <laughs> and here it is. And it's on the uh, pendulum clock for the study of clocks, and that's horology. And here we have, and uh, that may be the, uh, uh, the click uh, tick tock of the pendulum clock, uh, however you want to describe this trying to make something out of it of those uh, stars that are in the area. And there it is, hor Horologium. And uh, we can, as you see, we will be able to see all of Horologium except the bottom three there. We will not be able to see them because it is below our horizon. And so we are limited on being able to see that. Okay, Cindy, let's go back, if you will, to our calendar. And we'll see there we uh, were for Horologium on Sunday the 19th. We go to the 20th, the moon is moving on to the first quarter. We go on to the 21st, the moon is far away from us in the orbit. It's at its uh, close to us, it's at its perigee, excuse me. And then on the 22nd, we have our next constellation called Perseus. And we're going to go to Perseus. And notice, Perseus is called the hero, the rescuer of Andromeda. Now, where does that come from? Well, that comes from a story that I'll be telling in November and De December that includes Andromeda. <laughs> the princess of the mythical country Ethiopia, Cassiopeia, the queen, and Cepheus, the king. Uh, then also here, Perseus is going to be in the story. Uh, let's see who else is going to be there. Cetus, uh, the sea monster, is going to be in the story. And let me see, uh, Pegasus, the winged horse, is going to be in the story. So uh, come and watch, and I'll demonstrate that in November and December. And that will help you to pick up a lot of, a number of constellations all together and will uh, get you more oriented into the sky and do not ever let the sky intimidate you. Just take your time learning in the sky. Okay, so there's Perseus, the hero and the rescuer of Andromeda. Going back to the calendar, and let's see here, and there it is on Wednesday the 22nd. On Thursday the 23rd is Thanksgiving Day, and that's either uh, turkey or ham or whatever you're going to have. Now, uh, the uh, director for the planetarium said, go ahead 
and whoever wants to come on Thanksgiving weekend, I'm going to do the presentation of the 10 constellations for December to wind it up. That is the last Saturday of uh, November. And let's go. Now we have the last week of uh, November. On the 26th, we have the moon, and it's going to be close to a star cluster called Pleiades or Pleiades. And Pleiades uh, is Japanese for what? Do you remember? Don't know. <laughs> the manger. Oh, okay. Okay. And then on Monday the 27th, we have the moon at its full location. Then we go on Tuesday the 28th. We're drawing to a close for November. We have the sixth of the seven constellations, and that is reticulum, which is close to ridiculous, but it's not. <laughs> reticulum is the reticle or what you would look through, like if you have a telescope and you are going to look through the eyepiece and would be looking at uh, whatever the telescope is looking at. Notice reticulum there. And there you see the, up above, there is horologium, which we talked about. And then we uh, see here reticulum and it has on it, there's our southern horizon. Now, how much of reticulum are you going to be able to see? None of it. None of it. None of it. Now, there's stars, of course, in the uh, part above the, the southern horizon, but those will be the fainter stars to, to find. Okay. Uh, so there is reticulum, and we'll go on and go back to the calendar again. There it is, reticulum, on Tuesday the 28th, and we're going to finish up the constellations on Wednesday the 29th, and that is Eridanus, the equatorial river. And the reason we waited on it, even though some of you may have noticed, go ahead, Cindy, will have noticed along its left side we were having or on its uh, right side as we went down there's cetus and there's fornax and we go on down uh, but we wanted to wait there and get into the middle of it and there is eridanus the river and as we scroll down notice here eridanus that the bottom is the southern horizon so we get to see all of it. And it's a long river. And look up at the top uh, end of it on its left side there. And notice it's right next to our December constellation of Orion the Mighty Hunter. Now, Cindy, we see at the bottom there of the river, we have a larger black dot means it's brighter and it's labeled as number one so let's find out what it is so let's scroll down to find keep going and let's look for number one and number one is called there you go Akronar Alpha Eridani and it's our southernmost of the constellation of the constellation the stars in Eridanus it's also the westernmost uh, it's the earliest one that rises and it is the brightest of all of the stars we talk about along the river Eridanus and there you see that <clears throat> and as we would run on down notice look at number 15 what do you see about information that is on RAN, Epsilon Eridani? Oh. Oh. 
that's where Mr. Spock is and the planet Vulcan. Yes, <laughs> on Ran, uh, there, the star, and in the stars, that star's solar system, then Star Trek, the planet Vulcan must be there. And anyway, there you see. And that's one of the things that, that's interesting and fun to, to point out uh, that we have there. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, calendar page for us, Cindy, and let's see what we have. And we finish up on the 30th of November with the moon uh, there, and it's next to the star Pollux in the constellation of Gemini. And when you go through on November, We've added seven more constellations, so we now have 78 of them, which means that that's 89%. And you look on December the 1st, it's only 129 days. We have 10 constellations yet to go through, and that's only 11%. And then at the first of the month, I'll give you the favorable planets that will be uh, you can see between sunset, sunrise, and there's the four of them there. Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. M Mars is too close. To, um, Mercury and Mars are both too close to the sun to be able to see. Okay, that's it all the way through. Okay, so uh, Alyssa, were there any other questions? Uh, no, no more questions. Okay. okay. All right. Well, go, um, go ahead, then, Cindy. Yeah, thank you, Warren. Um, it's just so much amazing information. Um, I know we're getting close to the end, but I wanted to show everyone that on our library page, you can hit events and hit go here, and it will give you the next night sky tour date. Also, some of our upcoming events that we have for the remainder of the um, fall semester. Very so, good. Thank so you. So we did it on time. Yay. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but we will look into, we'll ask um, people over at the, the planetarium, you know, if anybody's interested in doing, um, doing an astronomy club, I think it'd be a great idea. Sure, so, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a relatively good place to go and set up. It's on the south side of uh, uh, our our lakes, and uh, it's a good a dark area. It's usually run, used by the uh, an area. Um, what I want to say, model airplane that they fly around, and uh, they do that in the daytime. And so the nighttime, they're not there, and it's available uh, when you talk with the Corps of Engineers and letting them know you want to go there, and they'll give you permission. And it's relatively dark there uh, on the south side of the, the uh, lake for us. Okay, well, cool. Thank you again, Warren. You're You're always welcome. fun. We're always excited to have you every month, and we've put a really special, another one of um, our CTC Astronomer um, events for the spring, so um, look for that. Mm -hmm. um, last time we had another event, he took us to Mars and back, or told us why we couldn't. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> so this time it'll be about the eclipse, that's so right. eclipse safety. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Warren. You're and, welcome. Um, we'll see you guys next time. It is gorgeous outside. Go soak up all that wonderful weather because you know we live in Texas and that's right. Freeze is coming. <laughs> the heat is going. <laughs> so all right. Okay. okay, well, we are ready. Alyssa, if you will take us out. Thank you bye. very much. Bye, Warren. Bye-bye. <laughs>